Good morning and welcome to this morning's session uh, from EcoProd. I'm just going to give this a few moments to allow all of our attendees uh, to join the live session from the waiting room. So please bear with us as we allow everybody to get into the live session. Brilliant. I can see that we've got people joining. That's great. OK, let's make a start on um, the presentation. So welcome to our uh, webinar this morning, talking this morning about how to cut water use in your organisation. Um, this is a presentation from EcoProd in association with the water retail company. So two organisations hosting today. Um, some sort of housekeeping points before we get moving at the core of the presentation. You'll notice as you join that uh, your lines are muted. So we can't hear you, but hopefully you can hear and see us. Uh, we are recording the session today. Um, that is so that once we're done here, we can get a link out to you so that you can watch the recording back. And you'll also have an opportunity um, in those materials to get access to the slides and things like that that we're using today. Um, those will be available for download. Uh, please do ask questions as we go through. You'll notice at the bottom of your Zoom control panel is a little Q&A function. Please, as, as questions pop up or uh, comments you'd like to make, please pop them in that Q&A um, and we'll field what we can in the background, but we also open up at the end so that I can ask those questions live of our presenters. So please hang around to have your questions answered at the end. So uh, you'll have seen from the invitation and things like that, that the agenda we're covering today is a few sort of introductions about us and the two companies, and then talking about an overview of the options for water saving products. Um, a little bit of a discussion about changing people's behavior and organizational culture in order to make water saving kind of the core and the default option. Um, some ideas for reducing things like bottled water use, but also cutting water use in some of the high water use areas, um, you know, kitchens, washrooms, the garden, air conditioning. Um, and then a little bit of a chat about um, putting in place installation, monitoring, maintenance and intelligent water management systems that can help understand the kind of water pattern, use pattern across the organisation, uh, understand where consumption is happening and then inform your kind of uh, reduction programme. Um, and uh, we'll finish off with just kind of tracking those sorts of uh, successes in a water management plan and thinking about the water retail company that you use. And then, as I said, we'll open up uh, for questions that you've submitted whilst we've been um, giving the presentation. So a few introductions. You'll notice we've got three uh, panelists on the call today. My name's Rachel. I'm the business development manager at EcoProd. I'm mostly in the background today, fielding the questions and making sure everyone is logged in correctly. Um, our two presenters are Jacob Tompkins from the Water Retail Company and Marcus Rose from EcoProd. So Marcus, if I uh, hand over to you at this stage. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, and likewise, I would just like to say thank you to everyone else in the audience who's joined us today for this webinar. As the agenda sets out, we will be briefly touching on several topics that all pertain to the reduction of water use in any organization. Before I introduce Jacob Tompkins, I'm just going to give everyone a bit of background about EcoProd. The beginnings of EcoProd evolved during 2006, where I could see the need for the, the addressing of issues around water and energy saving within the commercial washroom environment. Just to explain, I have approximately 30 plus years experience in the building services industry and I am personally very passionate about good practice, water management, and therefore conservation. At EcoProd, we, the whole, the whole sales team, we take a consultative approach to sales whereby we engage with our clients and prospects to assist them in delivering a return on investment timeline through projected savings achieved. This is also coupled with reduction in reactive maintenance, which we always feel is a key point as well. This is done through the introduction of high quality products that don't require as much maintenance as maybe inferior uh, products of the same item or use would be applicable. We work very closely with all the manufacturers that we represent here in the UK and we are often selected 
in this region to uh, work with them on new product development. So as the agenda sets out, the purpose of this webinar is to convey that we need to look seriously at all aspects of our water management policies. Water saving is no longer an optional extra for any organization. For those of us in the state's property facilities management, we have a duty of care to advise best practice. Along with that, we also need to understand the responsibilities upon us for water management, water quality and control. All of us must reduce our water footprint. We have an obligation to do so. But the good news is we can do something about it. Um, rainfall patterns have changed dramatically. And this coupled with urban development and population growth, our water in infrastructure is very much under stress in many regions. So this is exactly why I've always enjoyed working with Jacob for over a decade now. I always appreciate his in-depth knowledge of the water industry and his expert advice. We often discuss improvements in product design and washroom management in terms of water use. And you will hear us discuss as a team how to adopt a much broader water management plan and how we can help you. So, Jacob, over you to give the audience a bit of background and knowledge of yourself and then maybe take the first slide on why water saving is important. Jacob, over to you. Thank you, Marcus. I think I need Marcus to introduce me for any talks I do. <laughs> the, the admiration is mutual. We've worked a lot with EcoProd in the past. Uh, not only They're not only a product supplier, they are washroom designers, they're experts in this area. They're always happy to give advice to companies, even if they're not working with them. Uh, Marcus and the team's passion is water saving, high quality water use, all that sort of stuff. So it's, so it's great. Um, in terms of the water retail company, so in case you don't know, there is now a live water market in Great Britain. So you can choose, businesses can choose their water supplier. So you still have wholesalers like Thames or Wessex or Seven Trent, but you can have a retailer. So you can choose who it is that provides you with the bills, who it is that provides that service. Uh, the water retail company is one of these new licensed retailers. There are probably about 20 of them. Um, and as it says, we offer competitive pricing and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the main thing we're interested in is helping our clients use water more efficiently. So we work hand in hand with our clients to develop water management plans and to drive down bills, not through the lowest unit price, but through innovation, the use of the right technology, all that sort of stuff, which is the reason we like to work with EcoProd. We're doing a program at the moment with some of our clients where we are providing, in conjunction with the wholesaler, free retrofit devices. But also, we work quite closely with Marcus in looking at the opportunities for water efficiency when people do uh, large-scale refurbishments. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. It's not only about price, but I think the first thing I would advise people to do, and we're gonna to touch on this later, is to look at who your current water supplier is and whether you can get a better deal in the market. And the better deal might just be lower unit price, but I would suggest it would be uh, better service as well. And if you haven't switched and you haven't looked at it, you are on the water equivalent of a standard rate mortgage and you are paying too much. So if, if, as all of us are doing, you're looking for cost savings at the moment, please have a look at your water use. That's my, my first slide. Right, next one, please. There you are, Jacob. Oh, oh yeah, that's there already. Right, why water savings is important. Um, okay, so you'll have seen with all the stuff around COP26, the, the new climate um, seminar uh, meeting, global meeting that's coming up in Glasgow, that there is a climate crisis. What people don't realize is there is also a water crisis. And this water crisis has been going on quite a long, long time. It's a very slow moving crisis and it's separate to climate. Climate's making this worse, but actually globally, we're seeing increased population, we're seeing increased use, and we're seeing increased competition between agriculture, domestic use, and business use. The UK has already seen interruptions in water supply and water shortages. Generally, 
the water supply companies are pretty good at hiding this. But there are areas of drought at the moment in the UK. And over the past 20 years, there has not been a single year when there hasn't been a drought order in some parts of the UK. And just to put it in context, parts of eastern Scotland require water to be tankered to the north most summers. Now, the majority of people in the UK probably starting to realize about water, but there's still a long way to go. We use, as it says, 140 litres per person per day. Now, think about that in sort of bottles of water, which we're going to touch on later, 140 of those every single person every day. Now, in parts of Denmark, they are down to below 100 litres per person. Same in parts of Spain. They don't live that different lifestyles to us. The issue is they have much more efficient equipment and they have behavioural change campaigns that make people realise about this water use. So there is major stress, both globally and within the UK, on water. Water prices are going to go up. The availability of water is going to go down. We are going to suffer more and more from, from droughts. And the sorts of stuff that we've just seen around, you know, CO2 and just-in-time um, supply chains, the same thing applies for water. Just imagine if there wasn't enough water to irrigate the crops we need, if there wasn't enough water in the tap. The implications of this are very large. But on top of this, cutting water can also save you money and reduce your carbon. So heating water in your home and business is about the same as aviation in terms of CO2 emissions. So there are really good environmental, financial and social reasons for reducing water. We, we can talk about this for ages, but I cannot stress enough how important this issue is. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jacob. So we're just going to, um, between us, go through an overview of water saving products. The first slide there are urinals and toilets. <laughs> These two items will probably represent the largest use of water in any commercial washroom. The first point there, switching to water urinals, uh, we can save you up to 100,000 litres of water per urinal per year. So that's 100 cubic metres. And when you're doing the maths within your organization, that's 100 cubic meters saved both in clean water in and sewage treatment out. So it's a double hit in terms of gain. Uh, water urinals are also easier to clean and maintain, and therefore we can reduce costs in terms of reactive maintenance with the application of such products. Uh, switch toilets to dual flush systems. Uh, do you want to just make a a point on that, um, Jacob, about the um, sort of the successes within WC flushing? Yeah, so about sort of 10 to 15 years ago, there were um, toilet systems of 13 or even 15 litres in the UK. We've seen this come down in size in terms of new toilet systems, but we've also seen a large programme to, to retrofit uh, existing toilets, so reducing those 15, 13, 12 litre flushes down to sort of seven or eight. So there are retrofit devices, and these range from the, the modern equivalent of a brick in the system. So um, saver flush bags or hippo bags, you may have seen these, and generally you can get those for free from your uh, water retailer. In addition, there are devices that can interrupt the uh, interrupt the flush through introduction of air into the system. Uh, so there are there are several of these. Um, the main one being used being EcoBeta. Um, these are more expensive and more difficult to fit. But again, you could do those through an FM contractor, or you can probably get those from your retailer. However, in terms of dual flush toilets there is something called the water uh, label, which lists all of the different dual flush systems that are now available. And Marcus has access to a, a wide range of lower flush dual flush systems. So we're now seeing flushing volumes quite regularly of four and 2.6 liters. However, if you've never looked at your toilets in the past couple of decades, there are enormous savings you can make there, either through these retrofit devices, 
all through refurbishment. So the and the amount of money makes that mm, with a reasonable payback of well, depending on the depending on the system type, between three and five years, I would estimate. Sorry, no, that would be true, Jacob. Yeah. 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 And if you're doing a refurbishment anyway, then obviously it makes sense to investigate this. And with some of the retrofit devices, uh, well, you can get those for free. So there isn't even an issue around payback. Um, sorry. Uh, I think there's also an issue as well around leaking toilets. Do you want to talk about this, Marcus, or shall I? No, I was going to, I was going to pick that one up. Um, actually, it's yeah, quite a key point. Uh, huge. Uh, yeah. Huge. Um, I know I, I do surveys in organisations and a number of washrooms I go into and the dump valves are leaking into the toilet pan. Uh, that's because the eradication of um, overflow or overflow warning devices was relaxed a few years back. Um, yes, we can have lower volumes of flushing capacity so that the system totally empties, but these products do need maintenance and leaking toilet systems, as the slide says, can waste considerable uh, volumes of water per day if you haven't got a regular maintenance regime. It's quite considerable. Uh, water saving taps. Taps left running is one of the most common sources of wastage in organisations. And we've proved this with our clients. In fact, I have, I often have friends send me WhatsApp videos where they've been to a supermarket at the weekend or they've been into a leisure centre and because they know my passion about water saving, they send me a video of the taps continuously running. So this comes back to this maintenance um, PPM question that you can actually reduce a considerable amount of water wastage by making sure that your maintenance schedule is taken into consideration that these sorts of things are happening with any given operation. Sensor taps ensure that water is only running when it's used. So instant on, instant off. Uh, so the problem in item one above is eradicated and they also improve hygiene and cleanliness. Uh, it's just a proof. I mean, you've only got to have a tap running um, in a given area. It's going to cause some damage long term. And switching to sensor taps also cuts energy use as you are going to use less hot water. Uh, we've recently done a particular project with a, a client, a nationwide client, where we did a quite an accurate calculation of the non-delivery of hot water, and it was about a 12% reduction in their energy related to hot water uh, generation. And then as that figure says at the end, you know, up to 70% by installing sensor taps. Do you want to just comment on that, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. The 70% reduction, this I've seen this figure quite a few times. The it, it sounds, you know a huge amount, but actually this is easily achievable. I think it's worth also pointing out that there are other simple things you can do as well. Just if there is a leaking tap, how do people report it? So just a poster in the washroom saying, if there's any problems with this washroom, phone this number. I've seen this used quite a lot. Um, and also the installation of sensor taps or proper maintenance or this way to actually report failures can also reduce the level of maintenance you require. It can stop floods in the bathroom. Um, there's a whole load of advantages to checking how your taps are used. But I think you shouldn't underestimate how much water is wasted through taps left running. Yeah, very uh, good. Uh, so we're just going to touch on showers. Um, shower, shower technology has advanced considerably over the last few years. <clears throat> Uh, figure there are 40% water efficient shower heads. And also, there's lots of technology out there around smart shower operation um, and ele electronics within shower panels, so on and so forth. And if you're retrofitting your shower rooms, you can actually install purpose made uh, water saving shower panels with all the latest technology in terms of hygiene control, reporting, use and so on and so forth. It's quite a considerable thing to consider for those uh, organizations that are operating showers, be that for visitors, staff, uh, and paying customers, and so forth. We're just gonna move on to changing organizational behavior because we see this as a key driver um, for water reduction. 
Do you just want to uh, pick up this slide, Jacob? Yeah, so a positive behaviour around water and attitude to water is important. I mean, I think the first thing is, is water something you consider within your organisation or, or business? So I think one of the first things we would recommend is to develop a water management plan. So this behaviour stuff fits within that context. So everything we've talk, we're talking about today can be fitted within a, a water management plan and finding a single individual who's responsible for that and getting it reported up to board level. And this is a good way to start creating a water saving culture within your organisation. A lot of the things we're talking about here are free or very, very cheap. Um, and quite often the staff themselves are the best people rather than bringing in consultants, obviously, unless you're going to bring in me and Marcus, rather than bringing in consultants, ask your own staff. They will know where the leaking taps are. They will have ideas around where water can be saved. And that level of engagement and dialogue will also mean that they understand that the business sees the value of water. One of the issues is that even though metering in domestic homes is still increasing in the UK, it's only around 40 to 50 percent. So that means half your staff won't be paying for the amount of water they use at home. And they might think that's the same in the office. So I think, first of all, making people understand that any wasted water is wasted money for the business. Making people understand the link between water and energy is important and also the link between water and environment. And I think that you can then start to, start to provide the staff with messages around, this is how much water we've saved, this is how much money it's saved for the business, and you know this is equivalent to this many staff members, or split some of the money and put it into a staff fund. There are very large savings that can be made so having a dialogue with your staff will do three things. First of all, it will mean that they will give you feedback that can reduce water wastage. Secondly, it will mean that they will change their behavior so they waste less water in the office. And thirdly, they will become advocates for the business. So they will tell your supply chain and your customers and your competitors about the stuff you're doing on water, which improves the standing of the business and, uh, you know, a bit of eco-credibility goes down very well at the moment. So there are no downsides to engaging people on, on water behaviour. And quite often, your staff's kids will be doing this at school. And one of the questions that teachers always ask the children to go home and ask is, what are your parents doing? So if you can give them something positive to say, that's also a boost. There's, there's lots and lots of detail on behaviour. So um, if you have any questions around that, I can point you to academic papers or specific ways. But in general, the first thing is don't underestimate using behavior. So that, that probably brings us on quite conveniently yeah. to this big subject of bottled water use. Um, do you want to keep going, Jacob, and I'll um, yes. I'll so, in. I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of the impact of single use plastics on the national on the natural environment. We, we've seen a lot of this, but there are so Bottled water sellers effectively just sell plastic bottles. So that's the first issue. So there's a plastic issue. The second issue is quite a large number of bottled water producers simply fill their bottles from the tap. So you are paying 300 times more than you should for the water. I think the third one is that bottled water undergoes a lot less rigorous testing than tap water. Tap water has a much, much stricter testing environment. Bottled water is quite often left on a shelf in a supermarket or in a warehouse, getting cold, getting hot, and you get plastics leaching from the, from the, the bottle in some circumstances. Um, I think the other one is that it takes three liters of water to produce one liter of bottled water. And then the final one is Water is very, very heavy. The easiest way to ship it round is through pipes, not in lorries delivering bottled water. And sometimes it's flown off around the world if you're drinking Fiji water. So I would say that sometimes there are needs to have a bottle of water, you know, if you're at the station and you need a drink or something like this. 
but generally it's not too difficult to carry a refillable bottle with you and buying bottled water is a waste of money and it's bad for the environment unless and I, we were discussing this earlier there are some specific bottled waters where mineral waters where people like the taste of the water or for instance with bad war it's it's naturally carbonated but in general if you're buying one of your bog standard waters don't um install a sustainable water dispenser so there are lots of water dispensers now that can be tapped into the mains and provide chilled water and in some circumstances filtered water although it doesn't need to be filtered so get a water dispenser that is mains fed it will be a lot cheaper and a lot more sustainable give employees a refillable water bottle brand it with your company again that shows the company's ethics educate companies on the negative effects of bottled water waste i think most people probably know this um incentivize them for for reusable water bottles and and this fits back to the water dispenser so have somewhere where they can refill those um and then we've we've touched on both of those but i mean it is a really easy way to make an impact socially environmentally and financially it, it is a very very strange industry uh when there is perfectly good water on tap uk tap water is amongst the best in the world the in terms of water quality levels it's consistently above 99.8 percent compliant um bottled water is probably not of the same level marcus do you want to i know you're very passionate about this do you want to talk about this as well yeah i think you've i think you really covered it um jacob i mean this one is sort of um i don't know I've always been puzzled by the amount of water that's wasted in bottles um, and yeah, just the whole ethics around it. It just, to me, when having been in the industry for so long and seen the quality of tap water here in the UK, um, yeah, I just, it's always been a puzzle to me why people automatically think they're gonna get a, a better experience by buying a normal bottle of water. Uh, it quite simply isn't the fact. Um, but yeah, I think we've pretty much covered that off and we'll, we'll move on through the webinar. So some advice on cutting water use in high usage areas. We're just going to touch on a few, as we mentioned in the agenda. So kitchens, commercial kitchens, there's a huge uh, amount of water usage, especially uh, restaurant areas and even cafe and canteen areas for organisations. So one of the things you find in this typical environment is um, catering staff are habitually used to just leaving taps on. I guess we've seen this a lot of us many, many times. So we would encourage persons to move to push or spray taps. So if the sink is being just used for rinsing, that's that's perfectly you know good enough application. Water use water heaters much more efficient in terms of energy and water usage so you should consider that as sort of a, a do you know go to your organization and do a study on exactly what your hot water volumes are and how far that water's been pumped so on and so forth and see if point of use is actually a solution for your particular organization because um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of the savings associated with water are actually hidden in your energy bills so water is about eight times more difficult to heat than granite. It's phenomenally expensive to heat. So if you're just constantly running a boiler, but actually people are just using it for, for kettle filling or for the occasional bit of washing up, it is nowhere near as efficient as point of use heaters. So I, I think you can make quite big inroads into your energy bills as well if you start to look at the sort of stuff Marcus is talking about here. Yeah, and then that point about install plumbed in water coolers it go, goes back to the again to the bottle water scenario um, and then use your kitchen area to promote messaging to staff I mean you've got an organization got a canteen um, get the messages up there everyone will see it every time they go there every time they visit the canteen or cafe area um, there will be this message that's going to um, make an impact on all of your staff washrooms is another large area as we touched on earlier uh, we're just going to quickly skim through because we've touched on quite a lot of this already in terms of actual products. We'll say that again, water urinals, reduce blow taps. Uh, 
programming of sensor taps to reduce flow. Um, we can get tap supply volumes down to under two liters per minute or even lower than that. And in actual fact, you wouldn't know as a user that you are only washing your hands in such low volumes of water. So electronic showers, again, we've touched on this earlier in the products, but they can hugely reduce water use. Actually, sorry, Marcus, let's just differentiate between electric and electronic. By electronic, we mean digital showers. Digital, which correct. Can be, which yeah. can, they're fed from the boiler, but they can be programmed to deliver exact temperatures. There's none of this waiting for the water to heat up or to cool down. Absolutely. And they yeah. can deliver precise volumes at precise temperatures. So these more sophisticated digital technology showers are worth certainly worth looking at but also electric showers which are effectively like point of use heaters are quite useful for for things like changing rooms and stuff like this uh, a, a lot a lot generally less sophisticated but cheaper and also quite efficient so i would suggest people look at both electronic slash digital showers and electric showers or if that sounds too costly then you can get a water saving shower head for less than 10 quid and make quite significant savings no i fully agree yes it comes down to what the organization is and what the levels of use are and patterns of use so on and so forth and then as we've already touched on install dual flush um, or retrofit devices in wc systems i think just back to that one sorry marcus it, okay. it is worth saying that any business from a massive insurance company with 500 staff and very fancy washrooms through to a news agent on the high street with just a toilet and a tap can make savings. And there are products that are appropriate for businesses of any scale. So you can't think, oh, we've already done all of this. And you can't think, oh, we're too small to bother with this. There are significant savings for all businesses here. No, I fully agree, and I touched on, on it on my introduction that what we're going through in this webinar today is applicable to every and any organisation. Uh, just got a, a touch on this, Jacob, because we've discussed this many times, haven't we, about water features in buildings, especially in the yes. commercial space. So surprisingly, planting and irrigation and water features can be a significant portion of a business's water use. And quite often it's not considered because you have contractors doing the grounds or as, as Marcus and I have discussed many times, there's a fountain outside the door and no one's ever thought about where does that water come or is it even being recycled? So the first thing to do is analyze how much water you're actually using in terms of what. So even if you don't have any garden or grounds, you might well have something in the reception. Might even be a fit, might just be a fish tank, but it could be a, a trickle fountain or anything like that see how much water they're using what they're being used for i mean quite often these things are of social and health benefits people like water they like to see water they like fountains so we're not suggesting getting rid of these but what we're saying is you need to analyze them and understand where the water is being used and then really simple stuff like using drought tolerant plants or different types of grass fescue in your garden so this sort of thing and you can talk to your people who do your grounds maintenance about this there are very very good drought tolerant plants that won't require watering so you can have a nice landscape ground and it can just be rain fed uh, and then the stuff like mulching and stuff like this there are also moisture retention gels that you can put in and then watering plants early or early in the morning or late in the evening but again if you're using contractors they won't do that unless you specifically ask them to so again, communicate these sorts of things. And then we can move on to the larger items like rainwater harvesting or even the use of grey water in, in living walls. But I would suggest before you do these big ticket items like living walls or rainwater harvesting, get the basics sorted out first. Where does the water come from? What sort of water features do you want? How are they being maintained? Um, and quite often we have seen businesses where this sort of outside use or ornamental use can account for up to 25% of their water use. And I think, uh, again, Marcus has some examples where 
he's seen fountains or water features where the water has not been recycled at all. So it's just fresh water going through into the water feature straight back into the sewer. Yeah, so we're, we're talking about quite a lot of wastage in this area. I, I can verify that. <laughs> so, yeah, well, so we'll just move on to air conditioning and cooling towers. Not a particular area where people think about water use and volumes, but in all of your uh, analysis, as we're going to touch on a bit later on about uh, water management and having a water management plan, you've got to look at everything. As Jacob's just commented, you know, where does your water come from? What's it being used for? And air conditioning and cooling towers comes into this, you know, what, what is being used? Do you want to just touch on these points, Jacob? Um, because you've had a lot more to do with cooling towers than I have. Uh, yep, yep. I, I am not a HVAC expert or a cooling tower expert, but we certainly have seen air conditioning units and cooling towers where there has been high levels of water wastage. So there are different types of air conditioning. Some use air, some use water. So you have evaporative air conditioners. Um, the main issue here is around what temperature you're setting them at and what the maintenance regime is. So quite often people don't consider their air conditioning as an area of water use. And also they don't consider water efficiency when they look at the air conditioner. So when you're getting your air conditioners maintained, all sort of HVAC engineers will understand about water use. And if you say that that is a priority, they will be able to adjust the maintenance regime to limit the amount of water used in the air conditioning system. Similar with the cooling towers. So it depends on sort of total dissolved solids and things like that, how often you're replacing the water in your your cooling systems um, and how you're using water for evaporative cooling. So same thing, is the maintenance regime right? And again, we've seen an example where 10% of total water use in a business can be reduced by adjusting your cooling towers. Um, it's and I think the other one about switching off heating and cooling when the business isn't occupied is quite important. It, with cooling towers and air conditioning units, I think it's important to talk to the specialists in this area and get the balance right between maintenance cost, water saving and longevity of the kit. And your HVAC experts will understand this, but if you haven't specifically asked them about water saving, they will be setting the regime so that they have to do the least intervention, which might in some circumstances have the highest water use. Yeah, we're just really touching on it as a topic that needs to be considered as part of this overall package about uh, saving water in any organisation, aren't we, Jacob? Yeah, I mean, it's quite site specific, which is why I can't be more detailed. It, it will depend on what type of cooling system you have. But I mean, we've we've helped people in this area before, and most water retailers should be able to talk to you about your your air conditioning and cooling towers. But I think the key point is here: don't underestimate how much water they use. No, very good, and I fully agree. So we're just going to um, move on to monitoring water use, and we've always considered this as being quite key because if you don't monitor anything. You don't track anything you can't actually do anything about it because if you don't actually know the volume of water you're using how it's being used and understand all your connected equipment you're not actually in a position to make any reporting to anybody so have a regular maintenance regime this is very key uh, a lot of persons especially engineers might say oh that's fine it's, it's working okay well it might be but it might just not be so a regular maintenance uh, regime is very important and a lot of problems can be hard to spot now this is quite um, applicable to automated systems things like uh, commercial water softeners things like that they could be leaking uh, they could be discharge going to drain that you wouldn't know anything about because it's not visible and we've already touched on that third point there about encouraging staff to report any issues they come across um, it comes back to this culture thing and behavioural change and persons being passionate 
about their organisation's awareness that they need to save water right across the board. We'll touch on the fourth point, really, again, monitor water usage. Um, comes back to what Jacob said at the beginning. Where's your water come from? What's it being used for? And where is it going? And then the correct loggers and meters. Do you want to, you're more uh, yeah. associated with that, Jacob, directly than yes. yourself? So almost all businesses will have a water meter. Quite often they'll have sub meters. And in some circumstances, these meters might have loggers on them or they might be being monitored by the wholesaler. So I would suggest that you should talk to your water retailer and ask them, ask them about loggers. The advantage of loggers or smart meters means that you can monitor your water use on a daily basis or even down to 15 minute intervals, if, if that's what you want. This will enable you to check for leaks. It will enable you to see any anomalies in your water use. It'll be able to see the, hang on a minute, we're using loads of water at the weekend. Why is that? So it will be able to give you graphs of your water use. <coughs> and this way you can monitor where you're using water. And then if you really want to, you can put on loggers on submeters, which will help you identify which areas of your business are using the most water but don't just put on loggers for the sake of it think about what you're going to use the data for so the first thing you need to think is what more information do we need then you can use the right loggers and the right smart meters to gain that and before you pay for them yourselves ask whether there are any grants available or any support or whether your water retailer or wholesaler is already doing this and then in terms of loggers there are lots and lots of different sorts you will need permission to put them onto, onto the meter in the first place. And you will need to balance cost against robustness against the detail you want. As we say, some of these loggers can go down to 15 minute logging. But generally, do you want that? Or do you just want to know month on month how much you're using? So it fits in with your water management plan, but definitely talk to your retailer about what loggers you currently have and what loggers you can have. No, that's very good. And I just endorse that point there, that submetering, we've proved with some clients, Jacob, that when they've actually analysed uh, multiple building use, once they've done the submetering, they've realised that they can shut other buildings down or other areas over given periods of time, uh, which has got a saving in its own right, as long as obviously they're making sure they're keeping on top of their hygiene controls in terms of, uh, water in those buildings once they've been isolated or shut down for a certain period of time. Yeah, and we, we last, oh, go on, Jacob. Sorry, we quite often use it for benchmarking as well. So if you're a business with multiple sites, you can use the meter to benchmark one site against another as long as you normalize the data against either the allowable lettable area or the number of staff or the number of customers. Um, so it gives you a good idea of which sites are using too much and that could indicate a leak or it could indicate different practices there or it could indicate the area where you need to focus your staff behavior stuff yeah very good um and just that and, last... and, sorry marcus and 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 just to say that doesn't work if you just compare bills because if you've got an office in devon an office in london and an office in manchester the water charges are very different in those three areas so you could have the office in devon paying three times more for the water than the one in in london but actually when you look at the metered levels they're using the same amount so this is why you need to compare normalized data sorry no, no, a bit I, no i fully agree um, because we've proved it with our clients um and just about uh, equipment installed get it professionally installed organizations might think well we're doing price comparisons here. We'll look at what you're getting because you, what you might find is if a distributor is representing a particular manufacturer, you may well be automatically included for some after sales support or maintenance continuity free of charge. So make sure when you're looking at equipment being installed that you're comparing apples with apples. So you've, you're sure that you've done your analysis. And then it flows neatly on what Jacob's just been touching on about uh, loggers and meters there. 
There are a lot of intelligent water management systems out there that monitor water use within your building. We've partnered with Aqualytics. This is a product that actually learns about water usage patterns within any building, and you can set up alerts. So if there's a potential problem, the building manager or whoever's been given the responsibility to receive the alerts can get those um, sent to him, sent to his phone, sent to his tablet, he or she, and that leak becomes notified immediately and you have the option there and then to shut down your water supply. There's huge savings to be had in um, the application of such products. And also, I think I'm right in saying, Jacob, that insurance companies now recognize this. Is that right in their risk analysis? It is starting. So there are some insurance companies that are um, offering discounts. There are others that are working with these type of companies and are offering offering the kit. But yes, it's it's well worth talking to your water company, telling them you've got one of these installed and you could get a discount on your premiums. No, very good. And then other water management systems available. We represent the Conti Plus brand here in the UK. Uh, CNX is their all singing, all dancing, bells and whistles management system, whereby you can monitor all your connected products in real time. It's um, quite considerable the amount of functionality. So you can manage tasks such as hygiene flushing and the need for disinfection remotely. All safety routines are logged for future reference. I mean, you can uh, manage sites remotely. You can go into the platform, you can download data. Data is powerful. All these items, systems, connected products, all the data, everything you require as an FM manager is there in real time. It can't be tampered with. So you absolutely know that your, uh, your regime is in keeping, in, in keeping with Legionella controls. And then at a lesser level, but still very powerful, is the Conti Plus Surface app. This enables water flow and hygiene controls. Again, direct to your mobile phone on an app or on your tablet, where you can actually talk to the connected products in a given washroom, understand what the product is installed, how much water it's used, what its hygiene flush regime has been set up to achieve. So yeah, we're now in the area of digital water, something, yep. go on Jacob. No, no, I'm just, I'm just agreeing that the whole, there's a big digital water revolution going on across the whole of the water sector and having information on point of use water is extremely valuable. And there are now sort of artificial intelligence or machine learning programs that can help with this sort of stuff, but you've got to have the right appliances for that. So the sorts of stuff that Marcus is talking about, ideally, at some point in the future, all of these will become interconnected and they'll sort of manage your water for you. It's definitely worth looking at these new digital water solutions. And, and the other thing I would say is that, yes, they're available and yes, we can advise you and installations can be structured, but you also need somebody within the organization to actually have a passion for making use of the data. There's no point having data if you don't use it. Um, in other words, there's no point putting in a digital water system if you don't actually use it to its capabilities. Otherwise, you won't see the value in it. Now, Jacob and I have always said that the first thing you need to do is sit down and make a water management plan, put in place a water strategy. And we've touched on quite a lot of this. You can't, you can't act and you can't react unless you've measured and understood how water is being used in your organization. Um, do you want to just put a pitch in here, Jacob, and just give us your thoughts? Yeah, so when we talk about a water management plan, this sounds quite complicated, but it is as simple as just a couple of people in the business sitting down and saying, hang on a minute, where do we get our water from? Where's it being used? Where does it go to? How much are we paying for it? Like you would with your finance, treat water like money and develop a, you know, like, like you'd have a financial spreadsheet. 
get an idea of your overall water balance. And then you can get into the more detailed things that we talked about that we've got here. So talk to your water supplier about smart metering and online billing, but also think about what water supplier you're, you're using, whether you're paying the right bills. There are things like um, non-return to sewer allowances that, you, that understanding your water use would give you an idea of. So when we're talking about this, what we mean is water comes into your site and then there's a presumption that between 100 and 90% of that goes down the drain. Now, if you're a plant nursery, that's not the case at all. You're using that water. It's not going down the drain. Therefore, you can get a very, very big discount on your sewerage charges. And we do this all the time with our customers. And, you know, the savings are between 10 and 100,000 pounds a year. These are significant amounts. And generally, because people don't understand their water use, they're not claiming these. There are also surface water drainage charges, again, tens to hundreds of thousands of pounds that are based upon, and mainly in the north of England, based upon your impermeable areas. So if you've got a car park that's got permeable areas in it, you're paying way too much on your drainage charges. And these are windfall amounts that you can get very, very easily if you understand your water use. And then we can get into the detail about putting in smart metering, putting in loggers, understanding the detail of water use um, temporally. So, you know, across time, but also spatially. So across your different sites or within individual sites. And you can see whether, you know, one department is using more water than another. And it's a really easy way of determining where leaks or high usage are. Um, and then, uh, as it says here, just simple things like measure water before and after. So actually read that meter, read the meter beforehand, do some measures, read the, read the meter afterwards. Or if you don't wanna do that, then talk to someone like me or Marcus or to your retailer and they can help you with this. There's a lot of pressure on both whole, water wholesalers and water retailers to reduce water consumption. This is coming from the regulator and the government. If you go to them and say you want help in this area, they will be delighted and will help you. Or, or, or if they don't, then switch supplier. And as it says here, so they will also be able to give you an idea of water savings and return on investment calculations. And, and just to give an example, I was talking to a whole load of wholesalers at the end of last week, and they were really keen to supply, I mean, it's fairly basic retrofit equipment to businesses for free because they want to save water. It is cheaper for them to save businesses water than it is to develop new supply. So it makes economic sense for wholesalers and retailers to help you save water. Um, but you can't do any of this unless you've got an overall management plan. So the first thing to do is just get a couple of people together in the business, sit down, have a look at the water bills, have a look at where water comes in, where you use it, where it goes. I mean, that's one of the main things I'd like you to take away from this. Just think about water. And then all the stuff that Marcus and I do, you will easily then be able to understand the return on investment and the reason why you need to do these. But rather than just selling you this stuff in the first place, it would be better if you got the basics right first. Yeah, and we do actually have a water audit document um, hosted on our website, which we can share the link to. Uh, post this webinar and and just just to sing marcus's praises eco prod help a lot of businesses that don't even end up being their clients i mean i've seen marcus go and just help people and give them general guidance on water maintenance management all that sort of stuff and then you know if they decide to do a washroom refurbishment great but if they don't then it's promoted water efficiency and understanding as well. From both Marcus's perspective and mine, if people understand water more, we'll get more customers. It might not be the, might not be the customers we're specifically talking to, but in general, once people understand water, they understand why they need to save water. They understand why they need to install these types of appliances. Oh, sorry. Then there's a bit about switching water company. So. Uh, this looks like an advert for the water retail company. Actually, there are 20 different retailers. Um, we are particularly good on water efficiency, but there are probably two or three others that are also very good on that. And 
it depends on what type of service you want to look for. We are we work with very large customers generally, um, and we offer a very very hands on detailed service. You might not want that. You might want something different. I would utterly recommend though that if you have not switched or looked at switching you absolutely should because you are paying too much and you're not getting very good service and it could be that you look at the switching decide you don't want to switch but then go back to your current retailer and say we looked at switching but we decided not to but we'd like a discount it is a buyer's market negotiate on this you can save money just on the standard tariffs, but you can also save money through innovation and water efficiency. This is one area of your business where you can actually save money, uh, which we all need to do at the moment. Yeah, I mean, and we would be, we're very happy to talk to any client. And, and again, same as Marcus, if, if you come to me, and tell me about your business, and we don't think we're the best retailer, we'll recommend one of our competitors. We, we, we have never lost a customer. We only want customers that we can add value to. And we are very happy to talk to people about the whole market in general to make sure they're getting the right service. Probably one of the worst adverts in the world there, Marcus. So yeah, don't come cool. to me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just, just conscious that we're uh, running out of time. Yeah. Um, there's just a link there to some other resources um, which are available via the EcoProd website. And I'm now going to hand over to Rachel for a short session of Q&A. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I've got quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I would like to cover all of them. Uh, we are recording the session. So if we go over then um, and you have to leave, then we will have asked your question and we can you know, get that to you on the recording. So um, is there a concern with sensor taps failing to open and would there be a case to be made to include dedicated wiring in a retrofit over battery operated? Oh, very good question. Mm. Uh, failing to open, um, yes, there would be, but this is where it comes back to making sure you've got correct management planned management in place because that would be reported and it could be um, rectified very easily and very quickly in terms of retrofitting in terms of power supplies we because of the conti plus technology which has got a unique worldwide patent on it the solenoid um, technology is by stable and that means that the battery functionality has a very long lifetime. The reason behind that is that the actual solenoid only uses a very minimum amount of battery power to open the solenoid. So you could open that tap, it could be running for 365 days and it still wouldn't use any more power. So for retrofit situations, we, would, we do not feel that putting in power supplies for sensor taps is a necessity. Thank you. Could you just flick back to the previous slide? I've got somebody who'd like to see the resources. Thank you. Um, next question, how effective are aerators? Over to you, Jacob. Okay, um, I'm assuming that means tap aerators. Um, so you can reduce flow by mm, up to 40% using aerators. They need to be cleaned and descaled, particularly in hard water areas, but you can unscrew them and do that. Um, it depends partly on what the sink is being used for. So if you've got an eye wash station where you need a high flow, obviously don't put that in. Um, if you... Hmm, I mean, Marcus will be able to help you on what specific ones are right. But there's a company called, I suppose we're allowed to talk about Neopearl. There's a company called Neopearl who specialize in aerators. They will be able to recommend the right one for specific taps and specific uses. So there's, there's a whole load of them. They're all different colors and they can give you different flow rates. Um, but in general, yes, 
They're very effective. They can reduce consumption dramatically. They are reasonably inexpensive. And there are various different things. So there's restrictors, which reduce the amount of flow. There's aerators, which basically can add air into the tap. There are regulators, which allow the flow through until it hits a certain volume and then stop it. So they effectively mean that you can't go above, for instance, five liters a minute flow. So there are different options. So I'm happy if you want for you to email me and I can send you a list of what's appropriate for what you want. Or as I say, you can talk to Marcus or talk to someone like Neopearl. Um, if it's showers you're talking about, then aerated showers are extremely effective. Again, you can reduce water consumption by around 50%. They use a simple venturi, so they just suck in air. There's no moving parts. But again, you need to keep them maintained and well cleaned. So in general, yes, very good and quite cheap as well. Thank you. Um, I think this is one for you, Marcus. How would you compare the hygiene factor between waterless urinals versus less water, like low flush urinals? Waterless uses less water, of course. But I've heard reports of pure, poor hygiene and smells. Uh, it comes down to the product, comes down to the actual cleaning product that's being used, and it comes down to the maintenance of the product. I always say everyone expects to service their car. So you don't go and buy uh, a nice ve vehicle and then don't ever touch it. It's like water urinal. Yes, you get the benefit of all the water saving. Um, you get typically get huge benefits in reduced reactive maintenance, but the product has to be maintained. Low flush, the problem with low flush urinal installations is there is a chemical reaction between uric acid and calcium in water that produces mm. urine stones. That chemical reaction is accelerated at a certain ratio between the two. In low flush scenarios, that situation can generate urine stones quicker than a normal water flush application. But if you've got a waterless urinal, there is no calcium. So the actual activity, that chemical reaction can't take place but the product still needs to be maintained correctly. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, taps again, good hand hygiene is a major feature to the office environment at the moment. Colleagues are encouraged to wash their hands for a minimum of 20 seconds and wash their hands regularly. Do we think this will have a major impact on water usage? Okay, so there have been some studies by wholesalers and at the moment it's inconclusive this is because people have been working from home so they've seen domestic use increase large numbers of offices have been emptied and then when offices come back people have flushed through the system so you're seeing really peaky use in offices um, and you're also seeing um, different movements of people around the country in terms of no movements when there's lockdown and then loads of staycations. So it's been quite difficult to, uh, to understand use. However, um, in my view, hygiene always trumps water efficiency. So if it does lead to more water use, in my view, that's good. Um, water efficiency is about reducing water waste, not redu rather than reducing water use. So washing your hands is a use of water. The issue is if you're washing your hands with a full bore tap, as opposed to one with an aerator on, then that's a waste. So absolutely, businesses should be encouraging their staff to wash their hands. And at the same time, they should be putting in aerated taps and things like that. That means they can wash their hands most efficiently. But um, will it lead to a rise in water use? Possibly, but actually the, the main sort of water uses are dripping taps, taps that are left on, leaking showers, 
leaks within the business. There are lots of areas where water can be saved first. So I don't think it will be a significant impact. That's not a very good answer to that question. Sorry, it is being looked at and people don't know yet. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, what would be the ROI difference between waterless urinals and a, regu and a regulated control? Mm, good question. <laughs> Uh, every scenario is going to differ because it depends what the regulated control is set at. What we find for regulated control urinals is quite often, if it's sensor controlled, the sensor is typically placed in the wrong position in the washroom. Yeah. So that there is no control at all because everyone using that washroom is triggering that sensor. Oh, it, all the batteries run out. You see that all the time. Yeah, we see it. We see it all the time. Um, comes back to plan maintenance. It comes back to the original question about uh, waterless urinals, um, if, you know, versus low flush. If if products aren't maintained, you can't expect them to perform. We would say, in to answer that particular question as a guide against low flow, we would say about three years, approximately. Okay, thank you. Um, it's interesting you pointed out the water reuse and saving on the sewerage charges um, in addition to it. What different considerations are there for a retrofit and a new project, for example, in London? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, it's interesting that you pointed out the water reuse and saving on sewerage charges. Mm -hmm. Uh, what different considerations are there for a retrofit and a new project, for example, in London? So I think it's related to that point, the question you were, the point you were making earlier about considering um, how your water is being used and if it's being reused okay. and your surface right. charges so surface, and so on. What right, the surface, surface water drainage charges. Uh, don't they apply in London, but they're integral part of the bill. So you can't have any savings on surface water drainage charges. In terms of non-return to sewer, uh, yes, you can in London. Um, but generally, that is if you are using water for another purpose. So if you're a manufacturer or a hotel or anything like that, there is an opportunity for that. If you are an office, there's a lot less opportunity for that. Um, but to be honest, I would need to know what the site was, what retrofits you're thinking of doing, and it needs to be done almost on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm happy to answer direct email about that. Um, yeah, I, without, without knowing the specifics, I can't really answer that one, sorry. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, I think I have reached the end of the questions that have come in. So um, thank you very much to everybody who attended. As I said earlier, we'll get a recording out to you and um, the opportunity to download these slides so all the resources and things like that will be available to you. Thank you very much, Marcus and Jacob, for your presentation and discussion. Very useful as usual. Um, and hopefully we will see all of you on another one of our sessions soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, please, please follow up with an email if you've got more questions or more detailed ones. Thanks.